Hey everybody, this is Damien Gergia from The Breakdown Show, and today's guest is Randall Reeves. Born and raised in Northern California, Randall grew up reading and dreaming of the sea. He learned to sail on the rivers of Central California and often borrowed the family sailboat for solo ventures to the San Francisco Bay. This turned out to be formative escapades. While in college, Randall interviewed world-famous solo sailor Bernard Moiser for his campus radio station, a meeting that changed his life. Reeves Blue Water Sailing began in 2006 when he crewed on a 40-foot boat for a 26-day, 3,000-mile passage from Hawaii to British Columbia. Future adventures included crewing the Northwest Passage and solo voyages from Kodiak, Alaska to Hawaii and back to his home in San Francisco. For more info on Randall's voyage, head to randallreeves.life. Save the Brave. Go to savethebrave.org and support our veteran tribe. Savethebrave.org. Also, if you want to support the Breakdown Show, you can go to breakdownshow.com. You can donate to the PayPal link. You can buy our merch. You can always subscribe to any podcast platform. And you can also watch our videos on YouTube for free. Also, Happy holidays to everyone from the Break It Down show. Enjoy today's guest. It's Randall Reeves. Lions Rock Productions. This is Jay this Moore. Is Greg this is Jordan Harbinger. This is Dexter from The Offspring. This is Nathan this is East. Sebastian Younger. This is Rick Morales. This is Stuart Copeland. This is Mick Gillette. This is Andy Summers. Hey, this is Scott Baxter. This is Gabby Reese. This is Rob Bell. Hey, this is John Leon Guerrero. Hey, and this is Pete A. Turner. <laughs> This is Randall Reeves, and you're watching The Break It Down Show. And now, The Break It Down Show with John Leon Guerrero and Pete A. Turner. Yeah, we've been talking sailing over here. And, and for those of you guys who uh, who know, or maybe you don't know, um, we've had Jerome Rand, who's over in this window over here, say hi to Jerome. How we doing? Yes. <laughs> Jerome sailed by himself in a 32-foot boat around the world. And then Randall's like, that's adorable. Let me show you. <laughs> Look at you. You're so cute. He sailed in a figure eight that went through all five oceans and around three continents. It's bananas. So we're going to talk about that. And because I don't know the first thing about sailing, but I love hearing about it. I brought Jerome in to be an expert. And uh, and these guys were talking about like they're weathermen. I mean, when you guys were talking about like predicting weather and what's coming up and then how to do it and also the current and if you're in the current and the, Oh my God! It's just so many things to, to, to think and do about. But Rand, Randall, you you tried you tried to figure eight once, and then you did it a second time. This is a year of sailing by yourself. First off, why in the hell would you do that? And second, tell us what the hell you did. Uh, you only get one question at a time. I just want to make okay. sure that you know, that was why in the contract. The hell, so. What did you do? What did, what did I do? Okay. What did you do, so, Randall? To, to set the stage. <laughs> Uh, and by the way, to correct you just a little bit, if you don't mind, I didn't look at what Jerome was doing as adorable. That was a really, <laughs> really, really tough row. So come on now. Let's play it Thanks, straight. Randall. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, the figure eight voyage uh, was an attempt to circumnav- circumnavigate the American and Antarctic continents in one year. So imagine uh, I live in San Francisco. I depart from San Francisco. I sail all the way down the Pacific to the bottom of the world, down to Cape Horn, down to the bottom of South America, make a hard left turn, go all the way around Antarctica in what we call the Southern Ocean, return to Cape Horn, make a left turn, sail all the way up the Atlantic into the Arctic, make a left turn over the top of Canada into the Arctic through what's called the Northwest Passage, sail the Northwest Passage over Canada, Alaska, through the Bering Sea, through the Aleutians, Gulf of Alaska, back to home in San Francisco in one year. It's about 40,000 nautical miles, which is a long, long way. If you consider the circumference of the earth is 21,600. Uh, it's almost doubling the circumference of the earth in one year. Kind of a, a tall order, partly because of length and partly because of where you are. Below Cape Horn, below the capes down there, as Jerome will attest, is a difficult, challenging, interesting, everyday, cold as hell sailing. And that bit in the top of the world in the Arctic is also cold as hell uh, and challenging for a different reason, like almost no wind up there, almost all motoring up there. But the chances 
of becoming waylaid by ice such that you are stuck for the winter. And by the way, winter's 10 months. Uh, the chances of that are very high. So it's, it's a, a bit of a challenging go. And even though there's a legal challenge to going through the North, Northern Passage, right? Uh, now there is. Uh, okay. And this is what Jerome got to find out well, the last year, I believe, Jerome. Yeah, it, not, yeah okay. not prior to COVID. Not prior to COVID. Okay. Um, okay. So. And then why would you do this? Why would you spend a year <laughs> away from your wife? You clearly love your wife if you watch any of your content. Uh, I, why I, would I, you do this? I, oh man, I've been dreaming about uh, blue water sailing since I was a kid. Uh, dad was a merchant mariner skipper. Sealor was all over the house. Uh, we bought our first boat when I was in high school, and I immediately took to the whole single handing thing. It was I just loved doing everything on the boat: the steering, the sailing, uh, you know, the flush in the head, the cleaning the bills, the whole deal. I liked the, the everything, and so single handing uh, right away was a, a, a passion for me. But all all that kind of went went quiet in adulthood until about the year two thousand. I had a boat similar, though smaller than Jerome's, that I sailed around the Pacific in and learned in that two years of going around the Pacific, about 13,000 sea miles, that, yeah, I really did like this solo sailing thing. It was a lot of fun, uh, really satisfying. Came ashore, was very sure I wanted to keep going. Told my wife, I'd like to keep going. She said, what's your plan? I didn't have a plan. I just wanted to keep going. Um, So... (laughs) She said, well, you know, when you when you figure out what the scheme is, just make sure it's a really big one. And after some research, I figured kind of the biggest thing I could think of uh, was to try to sail around the Southern Ocean, which is a classic sailing route from the time of the wind jammers, right? Right. Uh, add that to a sail over the top of the world, which is a classic, classic sailing route that was only accomplished for the first time in the early 1900s. We tried forever to figure out what that route to the Northwest Passage might be. Somehow to combine those into one route would be pretty big. And I was right. <laughs> it, <wasn't pretty> big. <laughs> it was a big challenge. As you alluded to, I didn't make it the first time I had to sail home and try again. But that's because the ocean tries to kill everybody and everything. Like, you know, you can be, you're so insignificant out there. If you're bobbing around on the ocean, you are, your head is the size of a coconut. That's it. Like, that's what you are. And then the, the sea can be small and be 10 foot waves, you know, where everybody, if you're in a boat, you're fine. It, it's crazy how insignificant you are out there. I mean, I remember watching Rand's stuff when he was in the um, Jerome stuff, when he was in the doldrums, yeah. you know, like, yeah. You don't get to do anything if it doesn't want you to. It, yeah. And it, it makes you do everything if it hits your broadside with a giant wave. Yeah. Yeah, you are definitely in uh, a world of constant, uncontrollable variables. Um, you know, the ocean is moving, the wind is moving, the clouds are moving, the boat is moving, the sun is moving, everything around you is moving. And your job is simply to kind of marry with and and fit with into whatever is moving at that given moment. It's it can be really challenging. It's also entirely rewarding to get offshore, to be by yourself, and to realize that all of the problems that will face you today, you can solve them because you've thought most of them through in some way, and they're up to you. How you do it is up to you. I, I find, I'm sure Jerome feels the same way. I find uh, incredibly rewarding being able to see that wild world kind of on its own terms uh, and to be able to solve what's thrown at me uh, with the available very limited resources that I have on the boat. It's a very rewarding place to be. Well, and and if I may, I mean, when you're out there and you're doing it solo, that is when I think you find this connection, uh, not only for for the sailor in the boat, but also just with with the environment and nature and everything that you just can't find when you have a fully crewed boat or anything like that. It's that yeah. one-on-one that <clears throat> is absolutely amazing. And that's what yeah. sort of always draws me back out there yeah. as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's, uh, there's something uh, incredibly rewarding. Uh, and I'm sure, Jerome, you've had this experience in the Southern Ocean, way down there, 45, 46, 47 degrees south. The ambient wind in the Southern Ocean, kind of the everyday wind in the Southern Ocean is 25, 30, 35 knots. That's just kind of what you're used to. The, the seas are, you know, half as tall as the mast, usually. When the boat is kind of moving along but struggling, sometimes you're in just the worst seas you can imagine, the worst waves you can imagine. And you look out over starboard, and there's this huge bird just yeah. hovering there. It's called a wandering albatross. 
it is a 12 foot wingspan. I mean, that's, that's a wingspan as wide as my boat is wide. And, and there's this, it's just hovering out there in this wind. You can barely survive on your boat. It's just like canting back and forth and looking at the boat. Like what the heck are you doing here? This is where I live. Uh, and it's just uh, to see that kind of grace adapted to that kind of an environment. You know, those birds fly millions of miles in their lifetimes. They, only come in they only see land once a year when they mate other than that they're at sea all the time so they make us look like complete novices uh, out there so it's a, it's a great experience one of the things that i'm always curious about is when you're out there by yourself and yeah okay you can fix things that break you've got redundant backups and all that kind of thing but um there are times when you're like i don't know if it's a good idea you know, I mean, this has got to be those storms where you're like, or, or whatever those problems are, where you just like, this is dicey and uh, maybe more than I bargained for. Oh, uh, yeah, <laughs> that happens a lot. <laughs> Questioning I your mean, life choices. Right. <laughs> uh, as one limited example, on the first try, I was in the Indian Ocean just past Cape Good Hope, just past the southern tip of South Africa. and. I saw this low pressure system developing off of Rio de Janeiro. So like a whole ocean and a half away from me, I picked it up on the weather forecasts. And those long-term weather forecasts were saying that when it came down to me, it would be a monster. And at that point, I was way south. I was down at almost 50 degrees south, which if you're sailing in the Indian Ocean in particular, that's way down there and it's dicey. I had had really light winds from the northeast and they drove me south. I said, you know, no big deal. But when I saw this low coming down, I thought, I got to get out of here. That low is going to be right on top of me in five or six days. So I hightailed it north. And when it hit, it was it was absolutely as nasty as the forecast had said it would be. I had steep, uh, super steep seas coming at me, winds 40, 45, 50. I could not figure out how to sail the boat. The seas were so steep and so close together. I couldn't make the boat safe. We're knocked down which in sailing world means the boat is picked up and knocked over to at least 90 degrees with the mast in the water. It was knocked down twice overnight, bent the rail in over the winches, broke the solar panels. And then at dawn, I had just jibed around trying to find a safe position for the boat. And the boat was picked up, picked up by a sea. Now, my boat weighs almost 20 tons. The boat was picked up by the seas, turned sideways and thrown off of the wave down into the trough and broke a window, maybe about two feet by one foot. And I'm sitting opposite, it's like the whole pilot house is just suddenly full of water, full of like white spray water. And I couldn't, that was one of the contingencies I had not planned for. I had not planned for a broken window. Um, the boat I have has been sailed everywhere. It's, it's done Cape Horn. It's done the Northwest Passage. The only newbie really was me. And uh, nobody else had broken a window. So I, you know, that's one of those moments where you go, what the heck? Am I doing here? I have to really pause, think, 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 think. You go. You got to. You probably have to solve if you're going to stay alive. What are you going to do? And so, yeah, you you do have moments like that for sure. <laughs> I'm sure Jerome has plenty. Oh yeah. Well, I, it is. It's just one of those situations where out there, especially in the Southern Ocean, you kind of realize that at any moment the world around you can completely overwhelm you, and you know, like. Grand will say, you know, we, we, there are times where you're at a loss for how to be able to maintain safety in those situations. And yeah, I mean, it, it's, it's like a moment by moment sort of thing and the decisions that you make, but at the same time, yeah, I mean, you, you just don't have, there's no, there's no, the fact there's no pause button, there's no like, okay, right. well, let's just take a time out here. It's it's incredible, strange feeling to be drawn to, and I think yeah. that's that's one of the questions I've always had is why would I? And I get asked that all the time: is why would you want to even go down there? And I don't think I'll ever have a real good answer for that. But there's just something that draws sailors, I think, to those places like the Southern Ocean. I mean, would you agree with that, Randall? Yeah, I was reading a book the other day trying to because i'm you know you've written a book on your experiences i'm i'm mid throws and writing a book on mine and i'm at that place where i'm trying to answer the dreaded why yeah uh, it's it you, you get it every every presentation and as much as i you know I, 
I've been wanting to do this so long. I, it was really kind of took me aback in the first several presentations when people said, "Why?" Because I just so I just presented to you the whole plan, this trip. I mean, doesn't this look like huge fun? It's awesome, <laughs> right? Wouldn't you, wouldn't you like to do this? And they all go, "No, I don't know. That. that looks terrible." <laughs> so I had to really backtrack and say, "Oh, oh, right, right. Not everybody has this dream." I think uh, one interesting quote I ran across uh, in this book was, "It's a strange question." I do it because I enjoy it. I do it because I find it satisfying. I mean, you don't ask someone why he likes to eat chocolate. I mean, that's obvious, right? Chocolate tastes good. It's enjoyable. And I think for sailors like Jerome and like myself, it's we do this because it gives us pleasure, gives us satisfaction to be in that um, unadulterated world. Oh, that's a poor word, but you know, it, in a world where between me and nature is nothing but hull and i'm i'm about as in in the world as i define it as i could possibly be and i find that very deeply satisfying is that danger is that part of it i mean like I, i'm fascinated by the shackleton uh, mm. you know, adventure down south and then the fact that they could with no real access to the stars dead reckon to new georgia yeah. island you know and just you think okay first off it doesn't matter because they're either going to make it or they're not like they, yeah. there, there's no room for error, but they somehow managed, I don't know what it's like, like 1300 miles. And they're like bullseye or not bullseye. Yeah. I guess they, they got in the 10 ring, but they hit the other side of the Island and they had to do yeah. the first traverse North to South that had ever yeah. happened. And all sure. these impossible. Is that why you guys do it though? Is there some of that where you want some of that adventure? Go ahead, Jerome, you start. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I definitely think so. I, I, Without trying to sound like, you know, I'm doing it right and everybody else is doing it wrong, I think there's definitely a part of me that wants to lead a very extraordinary life, you know, go out and see things that other people will only ever read about. Um, there's something in that journey and that experience that also changes me as a person. Um, you know, when you're alone on a boat in an ocean, you can you can't lie to yourself about anything, any of your emotions, whatever you're feeling, whether it's good, bad, whatever. And there's there's a, an amount of truth that that I think somebody goes through when they're out there that I find really enlightening. And I don't know, it it's just absolutely amazing to me. I, I sort of got lost there. But yeah, uh, I don't know. Take it, Randall. <laughs> Uh, what was the question? Is danger is 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 yeah, the is love of adventure? Of Do you want to be able to say there I was thirteen hundred miles, no stars in the sky? <laughs> yeah. There's part of that, yeah. Yeah, there's sure. Yeah, I'll, I mean, you want the hard problem, right? Well, that's different. Okay. Oh, uh, okay. A, a, a lust for adventure is a lust for excitement. What you just said, which is, I want the hard problem. That's a question of, can I put myself in harm's way? Can I? put myself beyond my experience and beyond my expertise uh, and beyond even to a certain degree, my imagination and take what comes and survive and, and, and live it through. And I, 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 I think I'm probably closer to Jerome uh, than I like to admit, because I have, I have a reaction against the word adventure, right? I don't think I'm doing this because it's fun. Quite frankly, there are many, many, many days which are not fun at all. Um, but it, it is, there's this deep sense of, of kind of going beyond yourself and, and facing problems that I, I just couldn't find in suburbia here in Oakland, right? That just uh, our, our lives in suburbia are as dangerous as lives at sea, but it's different. And we're all in it together. Out there, I'm not in it together with anyone. I'm in it together with the boat, and that's about it. And that, there's something there that I really enjoy. But I think when I'm, to Jerome's point, when I'm deeply honest with myself, yeah, it's it's the thrill of having done something. What was that line from, from Blade Runner? That I've seen things you people could never imagine or something. Uh, that was something like the line from Roy Batty. Um, that, there is some element of that in it for sure. The thrill of, of, you know, when I cracked up off of Cape Horn and had to hand steer into Ushuaia for five days, which was like of life and death experiences, that was at the top of, of my personal list. That was really tough. But when I came into Bahia Cook on the west coast of Chile and started sailing in the Beagle Channel, uh, I realized, man, I'm down here where every other 
seagoing explorer was. This was how you got from the Atlantic to the Pacific, you know, back before the Panama Canal and back before big steamships. This was how it was done. And so the Beagle Channels where Fitzroy and Darwin sailed and north of me is, is Magellan and south of me is Drake. And well, I was in this great museum of, of, of explorers. And that was just thrilling. So, so yeah, I think I definitely have some of Jerome's uh, lust for adventure going on. Well, it's, it's hallowed then, ground in those places. Yeah. You, you feel, uh-huh. yeah. you know, not, not only the, the past adventures, but I know, especially at Cape Horn, you get that weight of knowing that how many ships are down below the sea and yeah. you're sailing right <laughs> over them. It's like, whoa. <laughs> is, there, is there time or is there any room for imposter syndrome when you're down there at the bottom of the Cape and you're like, uh, 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 can I actually do this? You know, I mean, you know, you can sail it, right? You know, you can get it done, but that imposter syndrome, does that creep in? What well, I don't know what that, I don't know what you mean by that. Oh, okay. Imposter syndrome is like, even when you're successful, when you're standing on, standing on the award stage and you're picking up your Grammy, you're like, they don't know. Oh, right. <laughs> I'm not that good. You know? <laughs> and it's all bullshit, right? Yeah. But you guys know how to sail. You know how to do this. But when you get down there and it's like, okay, look, so I'm a combat guy, right? And a lot of people worry about like, when it happens, when you get shot at, will I be able to stand up to the test, you know? And then you're out there and, and every time you go into combat, you know, you get a familiarity with it. And this has got to be true for you guys. And actually, yep. I want to, I want to yep. ask this part question. So remind me, uh, Jerome, later on, um, would you rather be becalmed or would you rather be in the middle of a storm, you know, or, or trying to surf away from a storm and have that danger? And I would say the combat guy, I mean, he's like, look, a regular patrol is a regular patrol. But when there's action, you know, that's where you'd rather be. I'd rather be there than sometimes struggling, you know, doing odd jobs in San Francisco. <laughs> but that that whole thing of, of uh, well, let's just take that. Let's just go into that part of it. Like, what would you rather have? And then do you have doubt when you're out there doing it, you know, in the middle of it? Like when you are on the edge of survival, you know, am I making the right decision? It, you know, am I capable? When all of these incredible people have sunk their ship right there where you're at. Uh, I'll start. Uh, I, I think, and I'm curious to know what you say from a combat experience. What I found for myself is, uh, in the moment of having to save the boat and save your life, there's just no time for reflection, right? Imposter syndrome is a, when you've got the comfort of being able to reflect on what has happened and judge what has happened. And no, when you're in the heat of it, there's just doing. Um, and there's, and people say, well, aren't you scared? Well, yeah, of course I'm scared. I mean, y- yes, obviously, but that's a component of the whole situation and not the master, uh, unless uh, actually it does take some effort to, to get the fear to, to go down. But I, I think my relationship to imposter syndrome would be when you get back to land and people say, oh, you're, you know, what you did is incredible. And you know, that's true. Um, yeah. but you know also that you're just a guy, right? I just, right. I'm, I'm a guy. I'm not Einstein. I'm just a guy who had a vision and had a very supportive wife and enough free time to kind of execute on it. Um, and enough, then enough free time to screw up the first time rather well and circle back and try again. And, and what you realize is that a lot of people can do extraordinary things. It's just a matter of kind of being able to peel off and, and dedicate that part of your brain to it and have somebody like I've had, Joanna has been very supportive of all of this. Somebody you keep saying to, you know what? Yeah, you can do this. You can do this. So. But in the moment, no, there's uh, my find, there's very little recrimination uh, in the, in the height of it. And then becalm or a raging sea. Oh, becalmed is so nice when you don't have anywhere to be. Um, it's like <laughs> camping on the edge of the prairie. It's just, incredible it's so gorgeous to be just floating on a slightly rolling sea no wind take down the sails let the boat go at night turn the anchor light on just pretend like you're anchored in some coves that's awesome unless you're trying to get somewhere in which case it's hell and you have you have to get to cape horn before april and so it's hell um, so uh i i think in my boat i'm curious to see what jerome says in my boat i'd rather take a, a good stiff breeze uh you know real i'd rather have the the gale. Oh, I'm I'm right there with you, Randall. I <laughs> and I I think yeah, if you're if you're in the doldrums or you know the mid latitudes, 
and you aren't in a big rush to go anywhere and there's no big ominous threat around, yeah, Be Calmed is one of the most beautiful places you can ever be in the world. I mean, it is, it's an absolutely magical place, especially yeah. I found in the doldrums where you have the huge cumulonimbus, oh, you know, wow. the cloud formations and the sunsets and everything are, are great. But you get down <laughs> to a place like the Southern Ocean, which I, I found lots of off on sailing as those systems would pass. They would leave yeah. me, you know, in 10 to 15 foot swell with no wind at all. So the yeah. boat, a West sail is a horribly rolly boat. I mean, it, all it takes is about a two foot wave for me to start bouncing around. Mm -hmm. And so you can imagine a 15 foot, you know, wave set and, and I've got nowhere to go, but I do know there's more systems coming. So for me, that would just drive me absolutely insane. I'd be really frustrated and there's, there's nothing you can do. I've never felt more trapped on my boat as I did when I was becalmed in, in decent size waved. Um, you know, if I'm in an actual gale, there's, I guess a little sense of being sort of stuck in it, but you're able to react to things. You're able to do things and you're actually moving as well. So I think what, like, like Randall's saying, it's that whole, if you're trying to get somewhere like Cape Horn before the fall sets in, yeah, those comms, they're absolutely maddening. They can just take you to the brink of insanity. There's a, an adventure writer named H.W. Tillman, who I think all of us in, in my line of work, as it were, uh, read with avidity. And he was, one, he was a mountain climber and a sailor, a mountain climber in the first part of his life and a sailor in the latter part of his life. And he was once asked, which is more frightening and which is more difficult and after some thought he said that he thought sailing and and offshore sailing in particular was the more difficult because as a mountain climber you can kind of choose to take on the mountain or not right you can you can always walk away whereas right. when jerome and i get offshore i can't you know we're in it uh, i can maybe reposition myself within a coming storm but i can't outrun it i'm gonna have to take it that storm that I, had, I got in the Indian Ocean, you know, it took six days to get to me. I was able to move myself in it, and it still clobbered me. And then once I was knocked down in the Indian Ocean, broke a window, it took 48 days from there to get back to safety. So you're, it's really committing exercise from the position of once you're out there, you're out there. And you have to be able to deal with whatever comes at you. Well, and I would say especially in the Southern Ocean because – yeah. You know, even if if the absolute worst happens and you're in a life raft, I, it could be over a week before <laughs> anybody could even get to you because they have to reroute, you know, even ships. If they know or, where you are. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You yeah. know, yeah. on uh, in the Atlantic, off the East Coast, you could still you could be sailing to Bermuda. Something goes really wrong and you could probably get picked up within 24 hours. Um, plus, the temperature is not so bad. The Southern Ocean just has so many degrees of yeah. of this could kill you that could kill you and that yeah. could kill you and, it's, so, yeah. and yeah, i don't know if your experience was this but i i found it really isolating and much of which i really loved right that was kind of what i was after was uh solitude and boy you really get it i we were just, we were talking earlier about sailing right off the coast of highly populated areas like you know the east coast of the u.s you got to get way offshore because otherwise you're in the shipping lanes and you'll have many ships a day that will go by you that you'll have to avoid or, or and take into account in some way. I went all the way around the Southern Ocean. Uh, it took me 110 days, uh, 15,000 plus miles. During that time, I saw two ships, uh, one during the first rounding of Cape Horn and the next one during the second rounding of Cape Horn. And inter wow. in the intermediate period, I saw no sign of human life, whatever, no ships, no planes, no satellites, no trash in the ocean, no nothing. You're really, you're out there. And, uh, and that's really great. But it's also like you, you know, after the knockdown where I lost the window and felt I had to put it to port, you realize, oh, wow, I'm a, it's going to take me a long time just to get into a place where I can fix the boat. <laughs> so, you know. oh, there was, well, the, I, you know, uh, somebody, I, I've, I'm sorry. So I want to go ahead. somebody quipped uh, on the blog at one point. He said there were many times during your passages where your nearest neighbor was on the International Space Station. And I'm like, <laughs> wow, yeah, that's that's really wild. <laughs> well, 
Well, and that's sort of the thing I, I was thinking about. And there are definitely had to have been times during your voyage and then during my voyage where we were the most isolated humans on the planet, like bar none, at least, you know, maybe for a day here or a day there, we were yeah. further away than anybody else ever would yeah. be. And uh, yeah. that's kind of cool to think about that you were yeah. very special one in seven billion, you know? Okay. So I'm, I'm going to ask the next question. Here's another question I get. And this is directed at Jerome, given the context of what you just said, don't you get lonely? Uh, yeah, I, I definitely get a bit lonely, but I, I don't know if it's, I'm headed out there with the realization and with the want of, of doing that alone. And I'm in it for that experience. And I think, I think any loneliness that I might feel usually would only come if somebody texted me or somebody was reaching out to me via the Garmin, you know, I could go, if, if that thing was shut off for a long time, I don't know. I don't get lonely. I, I find that I just get more and more immersed in the world around me. Yeah. And I always describe it as your, your brain sort of changes when you're out there and it starts accepting very low level input and it gets used to that. You know, when we're here oh, on land, yeah. it's computer screens and text messages, phone calls, all this stuff is going on and you're being inundated. But boy, when you get away from all that, it takes a little while, but your, your brain really can slow down. And then, I don't know, I find that, that my attention can be kept by looking at the ocean for four yeah. hours at a stretch. Love yeah. it. Yeah. Oh, yeah, for sure. And I've, uh, so to cap on that, yeah, I, I have a couple of answers. One is you're busy a lot and you're underslept a lot. Yeah. So you don't really have time to indulge emotions you do but not a lot of the time and i think people kind of assume that you're on this ocean cruise where i get lots of people oh the figure eight oh that sounds so lovely so relaxing <laughs> i was like okay <laughs> no it's not it's a lot of hard work and you're cold and you're wet and you're only sleeping in my case at two hours at a crack at the most so you're always tired so you don't really have a lot of time to to feel that sense of aloneness but the other answer i would say is very similar to jerome's is that to feel lonely you have to feel alone and i don't feel alone at sea most of the time i have company i have my boat i have items on the boat that i've through no will of my own just kind of named that i talk to uh, i have the ocean uh, the birds that come by in the southern ocean i mean if, you, if you've done a an ocean passage in the middle latitudes you see some birds and you see some ocean life you get in the Southern Ocean, and it is surrounding you. I mean, the prions, which is a dove-sized bird about like this, uh, sometimes they're around the boat in clouds of 50 and 100 birds just going and going, flying, like doing dog zoomies all day long, all day long, around, around, around. So you, you, and then you've got the big albatrosses and the petrels and the, and the whales and the porpoises. And so you, if you're out there to be with that kind of experience, you don't really – feel lonely a lot of the time i i you know i got lonely for a really hot shower sure lonely for a beer at the brew pub to watch baseball on screen yeah sure but for the most part no for the most part you know you're out there to see what you're seeing and, and that feels good when you were vlogging you would say we all the time you didn't say i i noticed that is that on purpose <laughs> sure uh okay. it two reasons one is uh i is a terrible word to use over and over and over and there was I wasn't with Jerome, so I couldn't talk to him, right? Um, so, but the other reason is is that you do. Well, I do. I don't know what Jerome felt, but I it feels like a we, right? It's not just Always. me. It's me and the boat and the wind and the clouds and the oceans and the animals and you know, it's it's a conglomerate exercise. Uh, is the way it feels. Uh, and your virtual stowaways. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, Jerome and I attacked it a little bit differently. I I wanted to be able to tell the story kind of as it was happening and and that meant engaging in daily correspondence and taking bit taking video actually and sh sending video from c on a weekly basis and photographs every day and so for me at least that added to the business that was hard work right you, i've got like yeah. two or three hours a day just dedicated to trying to kick out a blog post that makes sense and and yeah, so that added to the complexity of it. But for me, it was a lot of fun. I, I enjoyed 
telling the story kind of as it was happening, but it did mean I was in daily communication with, you know, three or four people. Whereas I think Jerome, you kind of, you completely cut off for a long period of time. Well, I, I, one of the conditions of my trip was that I was able to give my mom a daily update at 8 (laughs) AM Michigan time, no questions asked. And then, you know, she would, he would post that out um, <laughs> in a Facebook group and all that. So, Very good. but yeah, I mean, there were, there were a lot of times where, yeah, it was just that I'd send off a couple of very uh, PG rated ones, especially yeah. in the Southern ocean. Cause I couldn't, yeah. you know, be like, wow, mom, I don't know. It's getting out of control. I, I don't know if I'm going <laughs> to make it through this one. It was like, no, oh, it's not too bad. It's a little yeah. windy. Um, but you know, it was kind of interesting though. I I think I only made maybe three or four phone calls with the SAP phone when I was out there and sort of to circle back to the loneliness thing. That was the time that I found mm. I would go into a very lonely depression. The minute I hung up the phone, um, it was like my world came crashing back in on me because for that five minutes that I was chatting with somebody and could hear somebody else's voice, I forgot where I was. And then you hang up and it was like, oh, I'm in the Pacific at 52 degrees south. This is this is not where I want to be. And so, yeah, that, that would probably be the only time I was really exceptionally lonely. Mm. That's fascinating, fellas. I, I love it. I love hearing about it. It's such a neat thing. You talked about being underslept and always having work to do. What what is a common? And I know every day is different, every hour is different, probably. But what what's a common workload you go through in a day? Um, it's not going to sound like as much as you might imagine. But as we talk about the things we have to do on board, remember that we're oftentimes holding on with at least three of our four appendages. You know, almost everything you do, you're doing with one hand. Um, I remember that, learning this in the Pacific on my little boat. I remember I, I had a cutting block on the countertop and I was at sea and the boat's rolling and I'm cutting the onion and I put this pot on the stove and the onion falls on the floor. I lean over to pick up the onion and the cutting board falls on the floor. And there's like, it's just like your whole world is moving constantly and, and you're having, staying on board. I, uh, people ask me, what are the keys to successful cruising? Uh, number one is staying on board. Number two is staying afloat. And number three is just keep going. If you just keep going, it doesn't even matter which way you go. You'll run into land uh, eventually. Uh, but that, that whole getting used to the moving platform is, is really challenging. Um, I think for me, I, I kept a kind of a land-based daily cycle. I'm curious what Jerome did. So I, I slept during what were, for me, normal hours. I'd probably start sleeping at about 9 or 10 o'clock. Uh, I sleep at sea, unless I'm close to the coast, I sleep in 90 minute cycles at sea, get up, look around, you know, check the horizon, uh, check the AIS, which is the device that tells me if there's any shipping close by, uh, make sure the boat's sailing in the right direction and it's not overworked. And if all of that, and I can take 30 seconds and I, I, I could be back in my bunk immediately, or if things aren't right, I could be getting up and putting on foul weather gear and hitting the deck, and I might be on deck for several hours. It just depends on the condition. So the deal I have with myself is never sleep more than 90 minutes, but sleep as many of those as I want and, and as I can fit in. Now, the truth is, in the Southern Ocean, it's so active, and the weather systems are so dynamic. Wind velocities, wave heights are changing so quickly that you very rarely get a good night's 90-minute chunk worth of sleep. And so... Um, so napping in the Southern Ocean, I found was the only way to survive. And I, I got to where I was so tired. I just sit down and fall asleep. It's just, that's what you do. Um, so you know, get up in the morning, have a cup of coffee and make a log entry, check out the boat, out, make sure everything's going along fine. You know, make breakfast, sail the boat. Where are you? Pull a weather file, plan your days route and your weeks route based on the weather you see coming in at you you know, make lunch, change sales. You may not touch the sales all day long and you may change sales uh, once every 20 minutes all day long. It just, it really depends. And then on a long haul boat like Jerome's, like mine, after the first few months, stuff just starts breaking. You're in an, an, yeah. a really, really, really high stress environment in the Southern Ocean in particular, where the waves are, are generally very large 
And to Jerome's earlier point where he talked about the doldrums, it's oftentimes the lighter wind days where the most damage is done because stuff can crash and bang around. So you're, you're, you oftentimes have a to-do list of things that are broken that need to be fixed. And then another to-do, to-do list of things that need to look, be looked after so they don't break. <laughs> so you're always constantly working those two lists to sure. each other. And just you know, keeping hydrated, keeping fed, keeping the boat going, and keeping the boat repaired, that's your day every day. Yeah, maintain, repair, replace constantly. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And those those daily checks, I are probably the most important. Just being able to have your eyes and your hands on every screw, every bolt, every pin, anything that's going to work its way loose. Because I always found that it's a very it's much like the whole avalanche thing where it can just be one teeny little problem. Then on yeah. a boat, though, it can yes. turn into a massive <laughs> snowball. And then yeah. you're like, oh, no, that could have been so easy to fix. You know, there's been a lot of times where you find that that one little cotter pin that's that's sort of half removed itself. And you're thinking to yourself, wow, if I didn't see that right now, that would have been a huge yeah. problem. So, yeah, those yeah. daily checks are absolutely crucial. Uh, totally. It's the compound failure that you're trying to avoid at all costs, right? You know, like yep. the pin pulls out of the wind vane. And so the wind vane slams up against itself and suddenly the whole wind vane is out of commission. It's like, oh, that was just a pin. Like if I just replaced yeah. that pin, uh, that kind of stuff. Yeah, it's a really good point. But what I found for myself is uh, in the Southern Ocean in particular, anything soft mm. that was moving wore out really quickly. So all the sheets, which are the ropes going from the back of the boat up to the sail, all the halyards, which are the lines going from the boat up to the top of the mast to hold the sail up, all of those were, were just, I was like, you know, burning through them in a, in a week or two weeks, whereas in other parts of the ocean, they were lasting for the whole passage. And so staying on soft things and, and other things like your hands. Uh, I, I, don't know, I have pictures of my hands where all of the calluses, which become huge over time, where uh, my hands have been so wet for so long all the calluses and the, the top layers of skin from my hands were sloughing off. So they were really sore because I was having to do all this work with my hands, but, but I was, I was lo- I'd lost the first couple of layers. So anything soft really, uh, really takes a beating up there. My buddy's going to have a race car. It's a piece of crap. That's part of the, the point of it. And you know, like it's going to break because when you push something that hard for that long, something yeah. breaks and it's always, always a three cent part that we <laughs> tried to get for three cents instead of just spending 50 cents to get the good one, you know? And, and this is, we went to Daytona. We drove our stupid car all the way across the stupid nation in a stupid trailer. And it's, it's so many, so many problems. It's very much like, say, when you guys describe it, I keep thinking about these trips. <laughs> and we get there, we're at Daytona. We've got this big, fast car. We can go by every, we're just zooming along. But the car that won was a Saab, like 900, and it just went around the track. It didn't go super fast. It just went all day long. Just it never broke. It never needed gas. It just did this all day long, you know. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, what Slow broke for us was a stupid, it's not even a gasket, like a like an O-ring gave out. And that knocked us out of the race for like three hours. It made us completely non-competitive. We got the car fixed, went around passing 100 cars. You know? yeah. But we're just in, just so far behind. And you're right, that that constant maintenance, the understanding that that, that pin that goes through and there's metal and it's banging, ticka, 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 ticka. it's making the yep. hole longer and wider. And you're like, now how am I going to fix this? Hole? It's a, do you right. have to weld? Or what do you do to fix some of these fabrication problems? Uh, I don't know how to weld, number one, and I can't weld. My boat is aluminum <laughs> oh, okay. and uh, not really something one can weld up at sea in any case. Right. Um, I, I, I did a lot of – well, here's just one example. I have uh, a wind vane, which is a mechanical steering device on the boat uh, made by a company called Monitor. Beautiful device, all stainless steel uses wind direction to move a paddle in the water and that paddle in the water moves the tiller back and forth. So yeah, I can steer my boat on a particular course relative to the wind this, this, you know, all day, every day. And that entire device is made out of metal except for two plastic parts. Yes. Two bushings that hold the pin that hold the paddle in the water. Yeah. And I steer by that thing 24 hours a day. Uh, and it's funny, it, it, I had to go, I, it was wearing, the, those bushings are, were wearing out, yeah. not the metal part, the bushings yeah. that were keeping the yeah. metal from rubbing against it, each other. Yeah. And I went back to the manual and the manual said, we recommend we replace these bushings every 15,000 miles. Yeah. Well, I'm trying to do three <laughs> times that in, in one year. And it really, I mean, if you're really going to take that thing apart and replace those bushings, you really ought to be on a dock somewhere. And so yeah. that was one of the 
biggest problems, actually, not an emergency problem, but one of the biggest kind of crew that was a crucial device uh, for my cruise. I could not be without it. Figuring out how to repair that underway without taking it apart and then losing all of the other thousands of one pieces yeah. over the side was uh, that was a that was a big conundrum. And what, when you think uh, about no. those things, and I'll shut up in a second here because I want to hear you guys talk, but like on our race car, we put a lot of power into it. And then the A-arms that hold the front tire, so I'm look, we're looking at the bottom of the car, right? They started rotating like this because we have bigger tires, more power, and it, this car just wasn't designed to do that. So we had bushings, and we had to put metal bushings in there so that they uh, wouldn't, oh. you know, so we just had to overbuild it. But yeah. I'm sure the engineer at Toyota is like, why would you guys even – push the car to that like it was never designed to do that you know are, are these boats designed specifically to do what you're doing or are you guys pushing them beyond their limits and having to modify things as you go yes and yes okay yeah, <laughs> they are designed for this uh and you're also pushing it's i mean i'm sure jerome will say the same it it is almost impossible to relay to someone to who has not been there the 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 difficulty of of keeping a boat going in that southern ocean environment month over month over month uh it's just constant movement constant strain back and forth 24 hours a day and it's not little bits of strain it's big strain all the time and it's just really hard so my boat uh was built in 1989 in germany out of a very strong material called aluminum for a guy who wanted to be the first person to sail around the americas Germany through the Arctic down around Cape Horn back to Germany, and he had he had the boat built by a, a, a yard in Germany called Dubel and Jesse. All they made were really fine, painted teak decks, you know, beautiful furnishings below, all real fine aluminum sailboats. And he said, "Look, I want to do this really difficult thing. I need you guys to make me a tractor, <laughs> something yeah. super strong and super simple." Yeah, and so that's what I got. You know, it's like forty three feet long, full keel, aft tongue rudder, tiller. I mean, the the, my, the thing that steers my boat is has no moving parts except the thing that moves, right? It, it, <laughs> yeah. It, it has no quadrant, no cables, no complex stuff. Um, you know, big tankage, so I didn't have to have a water maker. I could drink the, my own water. Uh, crash bulkheads, so that if I got a hole in one part of the boat, I could I could hopefully stay afloat. I mean, it was really it's built for this uh, from start to finish, and it still gets into trouble, and it still wears out because it's it's such a, a an amazingly big place uh i i re-rigged meaning i replaced all the wire that holds the mast up in uh san francisco before i set up the first time and the guys in the boatyard there they looked at the size of wire holding up the mast and they said now nah, we we i'm sorry we can't put this size wire on your little boat we put this size wire on 150 foot boats i mean what are you you're crazy yeah. i had to explain look the previous guy who owned this boat took it to the southern ocean Rolled the boat, did a full 360 below Cape Horn, oh. took the mast out, and he had the rig designed so that the boat could roll and not lose its mast. So please put this big honking wire back in the boat. I mean, so that, yeah, and so built as strong as it is, it still gets into the problems. And the West Sail, I mean, the West Sail is in that class, that class of boat, too. Oh, yeah, as overbuilt as they come. I mean, I, I think the kind of cool part about the West Sail is that they were, you know, a production boat. I mean, they cranked out over a thousand of them, and the vast majority are actually still out there plying the oceans today. Um, you know, they've they've turned into sort of a a cult classic sort of boat because they have a lot of downside uh, as far as sea kindliness. You know, being comfortable in chop and and sailing to weather and stuff. But what they lose in that, they make up for in the fact that. You know, the sailboat that made it through the perfect storm was a West Sail 32, yep. and it didn't even have anybody on it. You know, it's a real, <laughs> it, it, it really is a testament to just how strong these and, and how overbuilt they are. I mean, you know, just like Randall's saying, when people walk up to this boat, they see the wires, and my mass is only about 42 feet, and they're huge. They're what you would see on a 60 foot or even yeah. bigger boat, and it's, it's incredible. But but you need that because where we're sailing, you're really expecting you got to know that, OK, the chances of getting rolled over and I need every bit of strength I can on that mast because if I lose that, then I'm in real trouble. So, yeah, there's a there's a concept in naval architecture called reserve buoyancy, which is basically for lovers like myself. It's just like how high are the top sides, how 
how hard would it be for a wave to push the boat under if no water went inside the boat? And what you're looking for on a long distance voyaging boat is reserve toughness. You know, how much can you beat it up? How much can you break it and still have it survive? So, you know, what I was going for and what Jerome were going for, we're going for really, really simple designs, not a lot of moving parts, uh, not a lot of stuff to break. The the simpler you can make it, the fewer systems you can have, the less stuff to break, the less your vulnerability and the less time you spend repairing. You already spend so much time just keeping the boat together. As much the, the more you can reduce that, the the better your quality of life, as it were, at sea. And and even at even at that, you still find the, the sea is is huge. I mean, you've got waves coming at you the size of three story buildings. Yeah. Uh, the challenge I had in the Indian Ocean was where I or I got thrown down was I had waves coming at me the size of three three story buildings, and they were like surf break. It was all closing out, like for oh, a wow. couple of hundred couple of hundred feet in each direction. It was just white water. And it was just, you look at that and you go, ah, there's nothing designed to actually sail through that. <laughs> That's, you're just, you're in it. And in that particular gale, it was just a matter of time. Um, so, yeah. So you guys hey. get it built, you, you super reinforce it, and then you go out and try to break that son of a bitch in a storm. Like, Let's go <laughs> <Yeah>. find some. <laughs> <laughs> no, you got to baby it through, baby it yeah. through the storms. But at the same time, you know, in Southern Ocean, you really got to use that forward momentum to get those miles. So when the wind's blowing yeah. really hard, you want to use it. And I, I wanted to ask you, Randall, what was your uh, what's your top speed surfing waves uh, on the boat? I, uh, I cross my heart and hope to die. I didn't surf all that much. Um, so surfing, just to kind of bring people up to speed, surfing is, on a boat is exactly what you think it is, right? The boat starts it picks itself up and starts planing just touching the water and the ladder, that ladder part of the hull, just like a surfboard. Uh, uh, Jerome and I sail what are called heavy displacement boats. They're not designed to surf. They're not designed to go any faster than their own bow wave. Uh, in my case, my design speed for the boat, what we call maximum hull speed is about eight knots. Probably it's about six and a half, seven for Jerome, simply because the hull is a little bit smaller. Five and, so, five and a half. <laughs> is that right? Okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, but there are seas. So again, my boat's 43 feet long. There are seas, many big enough in the Southern Ocean, where this 20 ton boat goes up the side of the wave, and the wave is steep enough that the boat starts surfing down. So instead of my doing eight knots, I'm now doing 16 knots oh boy. down a sea. And, I, and I'm in the pilot house. I have a pilot house so I can actually see from undercover. I can see the boat. I'm in the pilot house. Uh, there's this wave. I'm th- I'm throwing a wave like five feet tall, casting it on either side of me as I sail down. There's this roar to the boat and a vibration to the boat that is not usual and, and somewhat disconcerting. Yeah. Um, so I did that only a few times. Uh, and I never actually, to tell the truth, it felt like the boat was under control. One of the things we worry about is that the boat will will surf down the wave and keep going, nose into the bottom of the wave, and then pitch pole, tip over forward, tip over itself. And I just did. I never got the impression I never that the wave was so that. steep with, that I, I didn't really worry about that. I worried about going sixteen knots. I mean, that was whew, that was really thrilling and a not so great way. But uh, but uh, yeah, I, I might be surfed that I know of. Uh, surfed maybe three or four times. How about yourself? Oh, I I don't know why, but Sparrow just loves getting in good, you know, 18, 20 foot waves. And she, she can hold her line. Rarely ever does she deviate from it. And this would be with just a teeny bit of mainsail up or in the worst case scenarios, it was, it was with just a tiny storm jib. She did, she did a midship. So it's not actually trying to catch any any wind um but i i think my top speed was about 20.9 knots down oh. a tremendous wave <laughs> and, and yeah i mean but i at the same time i was in that situation where i was like i want to just keep going because i want to get yeah. out of the southern ocean and uh yeah. yeah they i i definitely remember seeing the the huge amount of spray coming off the bow and thinking like yeah. wow I, f- I feel like i'm I'm a, a Volvo 60, you know, ripping through yeah, right, the Southern right. Ocean right now. <laughs> We're often asked, uh, at least I am, uh, by sailors, 
how come I, how come you don't heave too or throw out a, a drogue? And, it, and so it, with certain storm tactics, ways of surviving, surviving storm storms are to not keep going, but to actually heave too, put the boat in a resting position relative to the sea or to throw out this big parachute type device that stops, kind of anchors the boat in the, in the waves. And I only used mine maybe in the two full circuits. I think I deployed it three times total. And one of the reasons is not that you're some brave ass guy and you just think you can fly through anything, but because you have so many miles to go and you have so many more gales to weather, you can't afford to just stop every time the sea gets out of hand. You have to figure out how to weather and how to how to make it go because you've got another ten thousand miles to go before you can turn left and go up into into better weather. Yeah, I mean you guys exactly. hear, well, hear I, about go ahead. Go ahead, Joe. No, 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 please. Well I was, I was just saying when say, you guys, yeah. Yeah, you go. You go. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. Well, I was going to ask what, what what did you have? Um, did you have any sort of emergency uh, plan for falling overboard? I people are fascinated with solo sailors falling overboard, and I'm just wondering if you had. I know some people stream a line, some people are clipped in, all these other things. What what was sort of your strategy if you were to fall overboard? Uh, no, that was not the thought process. The thought process was not falling overboard not is falling what is, is what is paramount. Um, I dragged the line for a while uh, and I realized <clears throat> after the first 10,000 miles that the reason I was breaking the the breakaway tube on the wind vane, which is a kind of a uh, on the water paddle part of the wind vane it's it's a it's a thin tube that's designed to break if the paddle hits anything in the water so you don't actually damage the whole unit you just break the it's like a fuse Um, so i was breaking one of those every few thousand miles i couldn't figure what was going on and what i finally realized was this line i was dragging in the water was fouling on that on the paddle and so i i took it in i i'd stop doing that i the previous owner of the boat who had a couple of full circumnavigations in moli he 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 attached a line to the bow and a line to the to the starboard quarter and port quarter and let it kind of hang over the top sides a little bit so that if it fell in the water he could grab that top sides on on mower they're like four feet so there's no way if i'm in the water i'm not grabbing the top sides the gunnel it's just too high Right. So that was his strategy. My strategy, I didn't do that. I I clipped in. And I actually ran a line from the center of the cockpit to the base of the mast. And I clipped into that. Most Almost all of my trips forward are to the main mast to reef the mainsail. And my reasoning was, I, I have these lines running down each side of the boat, jack lines that I can clip into. But the tether I'm wearing is six feet long. And if I get swept... I'm going in the water and I'm going to be dragged by this boat that's going four, five, six, eight knots, whatever it is. And if I'm in the water being dragged, it's going to be almost impossible to get out. It's just, I'll be attached to the boat. Great. But I won't be able to pull myself back up. There's just too much water pressure. Um, so I, I clipped into a center run line so that if I was swept over the side, I would just barely go over the side. I'd still be kind of tangled in the, in the lifeline. And that's what I used when I was going forward. Um, one of the challenges, I think, on a, a super long cruise, and I'm curious to see what you say, Jerome, is that you get very comfortable. You, you realize that it's hard to fall overboard. You, you get very tuned in to what's going in on the boat and how the boat's yeah. moving. And so there were times there are, you don't always have time to clip in. It's, it's time consuming. And then you have this thing to to deal with that's attaching your umbilical cord. So there are times when you've got to do something now and just run up forward and take care of it and make sure, as my dad would say, one hand for you, one hand for the ship. Um, but, yeah. But, oh, yeah, but I clipped, clipped in a lot and, and, uh, and I use that center line more than the one going forward to the bow. Gotcha. Yeah. Cause I, I just, I remember when I was trying to prep and, and get ready for my trip, my sort of focus initially, because I know Matt Rutherford, he used to drag a line when he first started his around the Americas. Um, and I figured, you know, there's no way I'm going to be able to pull myself back up right. just using this line, especially if it's been in the water for six months yeah. and it's probably just going to snap. Right. But I did attempt to try and figure out a way 
to almost have like a tripping line uh, yeah. that would be attached to the wind vane. So yep. that if you could just get to that to put some pressure on it, it would make it so that the wind vane is disabled and therefore yep. the boat would eventually round up. But I don't know. I never was able to figure out a system that, that wouldn't, like you said, get tangled up and create, you know, more problems with the, with the wind vane. So yeah. I was just curious about that. Yeah. It's a, it, it's your point. It's also a common question uh, that I get in presentations and uh, it's just like it's one of those things that once you get to see, you figure out the system you're going to use, you yeah. get in the groove of it. You don't really think about it anymore. Uh, I don't look over yeah. the side and go, "God, I have to remember not to fall over today." <laughs> yeah, you know, you, know, yeah, you, yeah, you right. don't, you don't think that. So that's well, I, I get like, in um, trouble. I, <laughs> I get in trouble uh, during my presentations because they see the videos and I'm never clipped in, and they're sort yeah. of like. What's the deal with that? You got to explain that. Yeah. I, I don't think I've ever done a Q&A without having to go through that whole thing, yeah. but we won't yeah. go into that today. <laughs> right. <laughs> I actually, this is a taboo conversation in my family because during my first cruise in Murr, which was a 30-foot <laughs> sailboat, I actually fell overboard and I wasn't clipped in. Uh, I was uh, coming oh. north, from Hawaii, north from Hawaii back to British Columbia in 2012, and this was a year after that big tsunami in Japan had pulled off, what was it, like 1.5 trillion tons of stuff into the water. So there's these huge debris fields north of Hawaii that were heading east. And I was sailing through it, and I was collecting stuff for the University of Hawaii just to show them what was out there. And I remember finding this one artifact. It was the only actually truly clearly Japanese artifact that I had found. It was a rice bag with kanji. Uh, Japanese language on it. I really wanted it. Almost no wind, right? I'm just like going two knots. Tack around, reach over the side, and miss. Tack around, reach over the side, miss. Tack around, reach way over the side, and the sea just kind of goes boink, and I flop into the ocean. It's like, whoa, boy, talk about waking up fast. <laughs> that was a smaller boat and had a lower freeboard, so I could actually, I could actually keep up with the boat swimming for a brief time, and I just <clears throat> reached it forward. And I, I remember when I, I told my wife that she said that. I almost <laughs> walked across the water to your position to slap you in the face and tell you to be clipped in. So I'm all, I'm always clipped in. <clears throat> Good <Ever> man. <laughs> There's, but I mean, when you when you do stuff like that, where your life is on the line, you do learn an elegance to your movement. You know, you have to go get you know things done in a certain amount of time. And combat is the same way. Where, mm -hmm. what do you mean you don't wear a helmet? Like, well, you know, in this I've got a helmet with me, but there's reasons why I don't wear a helmet. There's a there's a, a madness to my method, but there's also a method to my madness. Yeah. And and I totally get what you guys are saying. You, you make you mitigate risk, and for folks who don't ever have to mitigate risk like that, like like when the whole pandemic thing broke out, I've been hit by a tank, right? <laughs> so it's hard for me to be terribly terrified. Of, of a lot of things because a tank mm -hmm. hits you and you don't really survive, you know? So we, we get a different perspective on things. I wanted to ask you guys, uh, I think about people like Chris Burditch who like stand up paddle boarded from here to forever. Um, guys like Richard Halliburton who ultimately died on an adventure. I don't know if you guys know who Richard is, but he swam across the Panama Canal and he was like an early uh, 20th century adventurer, did all kinds of crazy things. Or um, that guy that swam around the UK and had like a jellyfish attached to his face as he's doing oh. it. And, and like, yeah. yeah, to your guys' point, like he had to swim every day. And it's like, no, I have to swim for eight and a half hours today because I can't lose any more. Like the ocean decides where he goes because he can only swim, right? And so he had to be on a pace. He had to go out even if he didn't feel well, you know, it, and, and go out and do that. So who do you guys? It's just crazy. Like the guys that do this, forget it, they're bananas. What was the question? I missed the question. Well, just in general, like adventurers, when you hear about people doing things that are insane, like swimming around the UK and, and all those oh, kind oh, of impossibly oh. hard things, who who do you guys look at and go, wow, why? Oh, oh yeah. Alex Honnell, the, the guy who free oh, yeah. the uh, El Capitan. <laughs> Done. No way. <laughs> Have you uh, seen I that movie, Don Wall? Would... Oh, yeah. I've <laughs> seen Don Wall. Those guys guys are crazy too i you know that's that's a whole different thing and you know honestly i think that sort of free soloing uh you know no lines climbing a mountain yeah. like a huge face like that i think that's pretty close to ocean offshore sailing because you know there is no pause button for those guys either right. it's not like yeah. they could be like somebody lower down a line 
they're in it. And if things yeah. start getting iffy, they've got to deal with it. But <laughs> boy, yeah. that makes my palms sweat just thinking about some of the video of those guys <laughs> doing that. That's fascinating. I, I hadn't thought of that, and I completely concur. I, I look at that, and I, I think to myself, that's nuts. And it's just absolutely nuts to, to free solo something like that to your point where you, you've got to go up or down. You can't just hang. You are in it. And if you get a, a storm coming through El Cap, you're toast, right? I, yeah, yeah, that's funny. And, and, and I think it's really interesting to me because people look at, at us like that. You're crazy to go do that kind of sailing. And it doesn't look, I don't know if it looks crazy to drone, but the stuff that we've done doesn't look crazy to me. Because mm-hmm. why? Why is that? Because we've thought about it a ton. Uh, we've prepared. We've practiced. We've done other cruises. We get at least most of the requirements. We've planned it out. And I've got, what, 15, 16 different spreadsheets just trying to work out the mileage for the figure eight. And so for me, it doesn't look crazy because... I have figured out how to do it and that it can be done by a human. I don't know if I can do it, but I know that it can be done. And so in that way, I've kind of mitigated the risk. Whereas I look at the wall climber and go, I have a clue, right? I have no <laughs> idea about technique or any background. It just looks absolutely bonkers. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I don't want to take anywhere you guys' time, but it's such a great conversation. It's so neat to, to share this with you guys. I mean, I want to ask what's next for the both of you and all that kind of thing, but that'll take us another 20 minutes. I just, I want to just first off, thank you guys for doing this and and thank you for living these lives and showing us, uh, you know, what's out there. I just read uh, Sebastian Younger and he's going to be on the show in two weeks, but I just read his new book, Freedom. And basically him and his buddies went out and they walked uh, along a river and a railroad line, you know, same kind of thing. They went out on an adventure by themselves, no help, no nothing else, and just went walking. And it's just, it's so, it sticks to us as humans to want to go do these things that are hard, that are uh, isolated and and dangerous, you know. And th- believe it or not, on this trip that Sebastian and his buddies did, people shot at them. Oh, just because they were walking down the road, wow. like, let's shoot at oh. these guys, you know. Yeah, crazy oh. things like that happen. Wow. So it's, uh, it's fascinating to hear you guys talk about all this stuff. I'd love to have you guys come back and do some more of it. Um, just briefly, what are each of you working on next in terms of like any kind of big adventures? Uh, Randall, would you go first? Uh, sure. I uh, COVID's kind of taken the wind out of uh, our sails, I think, as sailors, because most countries are closed. We just can't go there. Uh, so I, I've been working on a project where uh, the weird thing about the figure eight voyage is that you don't go anywhere quickly, but you go too fast and I didn't get to stop. So there are a lot of places that I really didn't get to see. Like I went through the Northwest passage, but I did it in 48 days. I got to see hardly anything. And one of the things that would fascinate me going forward is, is freezing in for winter in the high North, but it's going to, it won't be this winter. Um, countries, even with the vaccines, countries aren't, aren't open. So that, and the, the other thing I'd really like to do is be able to go around the Southern ocean more slowly. There are lots and lots of islands, yeah. uh, remote, uninhabited bird sanctuary islands that would just be incredible to be able to explore. So those are two, two things I'm, I'm working on other than a book. And that book is really what I'm working on right now. I have a picture book, uh, the figure eight voyage available on my website. Uh, but I'm working on a narrative now as well. And there's a link for that right there in the bottom of the show for those of you guys watching. Jerome, what about you? What's next? Well, uh, within the next probably week, I'm sailing from South Carolina up to Maine, which will be a, a mini adventure in itself. And that'll take probably about 12 days, two weeks. And then future endeavors. I think it's actually that this upcoming sale is going to make or break my solo sailing career because my last trip was such a blow as far as uh, to what it was like to be out there to, to really feel like I couldn't stop anywhere. I couldn't go anywhere. And there were hurricanes there. It was a really bad trip. Um, so, but there is one, there's a little glimmer of hope. I have a very, very distant relative who was in the phosphates trade back in the 1800s. And he was marooned on, we believe it was Howland Island uh, in the Pacific for nine months. And, and I've always thought about recreating his trip from Portsmouth, oh, wow. New Hampshire, all the way down around the Horn backwards, up to the island, and then sail back down. And so double Cape Horn, but not have to go around the world, so to speak. Um, 
it would be a pretty sizable trip for sure. But uh, like I said, I've got to make sure that I'm doing it for the right reasons and because I really want the journey and the adventure. Um, you know, if you're not in a trip 100% like that, there's just no way you're going to be successful. So mm-hmm. that's uh, we'll, we'll have to just see, but time will tell. Because if I do, I'd be leaving for that sometime in like October, probably. All right. Well, if you get it together, let's have you come on the show and, and brief us, <laughs> and then we'll like, we'll, we'll do. We'll, we'll do. Any, we'll any last comments or questions at all? No, just thank you for the opportunity. It's fun to uh, talk about the experience and uh, what made it unique. <laughs>